Hi guys, today we're going to go ahead and talk about projectile motion. Let's jump right in. First essential question, what is a projectile and what forces are acting upon it? Okay. I know we haven't talked a lot about forces, but we have talked about accelerations and velocities. And so we'll kind of look at a projectile in terms of separating out the horizontal and vertical component of the velocity to be able to look at how movement of a projectile occurs within space. Number two, what is the optimal angle for maximum distance? If we launch a projectile, what angle is going to give us the greatest distance covered? And the number three, what is the difference between a traditional kinematics problem and one with projectile motion? So let's go ahead and start by just examining what a projectile is. In physics, this is a very specific definition. In physics, a projectile is an object upon which the only force acting upon it is gravity. As soon as you throw something, drop something, etc., it becomes a projectile because the only force acting on it is gravity. And there are tons of examples of projectiles. Everything from a dropped object from rest, an object which is thrown vertically upward, an object which is thrown upward at an angle or downward at an angle, these are all projectiles as soon as they leave the hand of the person who's throwing. Now, one key assumption here that we've talked a little bit about before when we were doing our gravity problems is that all of these examples assume that the influence of air resistance is negligible, that it's small enough that we can ignore it in terms of the math. Now, there are many instances where this is not necessarily true, but for what we're covering here in this class, this is the major assumption we're gonna go ahead and make. So, if we were to do a free body diagram, Okay, this isn't just like the drawings we've been doing at the beginning of every single problem we've done. A projectile is an object which once you project it or drop it or relaunch it, continues in motion because of its own inertia and is only influenced by the downward force of gravity, which if you remember is 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth. Now the path that a projectile takes, we've also discussed as well, and this is something that many of you have probably been working on recently in your math classes, and that's a parabola. The path of a projectile or its trajectory is what's known as a parabola. And so you can see here, there are two halves to a parabola, okay, the uphill portion and the downhill portion. And the two, if we neglect air resistance, should be the same. Okay, what goes up comes down and the speed at the same height should be the same. Now, one of the key things to look at in terms of parabolic motion is how, what changes in terms of the velocity horizontally versus what changes in the velocity vertically. So let's take a closer look at parabolic motion of a projectile. In this particular diagram, we have two pieces. One, the gravity free path, which is gonna just continue going the same amount of distance every single second, because again, we're neglecting air resistance. And the portion, which is the vertical free fall. If we were to just drop it, what would happen to the object in terms of its acceleration due to gravity? The actual parabolic motion is the combination of the two, the forward motion without air resistance and the acceleration due to gravity creating the par parabola. Now, because these two things can be treated separately, we are going to often use composite vectors to go ahead and describe the motion of an object. This is essentially true, whether we're dealing with uh, you know, projectile motion as we are here, or in other cases, different motions. But vectors and parabolic motion actually reflect the Y component or the vertical component and the X component or the horizontal component. Now, we've talked about the fact that I, I did a lot of track and even went to college and did some track in college. When we start looking at track and field activities, the approach and how jumps are occurring, depending on what event you're doing, are different. How much of the force is being applied vertically versus how much of the force is being applied horizontally. Let's give you a quick example. In this particular comparison, we are looking at an individual who is doing hurdles versus an individual who is long jumping. 
in the long jump, we need to get more of a vertical component while maintaining speed to get the maximum amount of distance out of our jump. A hurdler is not looking at that. A hurdler is trying to go for speed. And so a hurdler wants to get up just high enough to get over the hurdles and keep moving forward so they can optimize the horizontal component of their motion. Okay, so you can see in these two particular examples, the hurdler is moving forward at 7.49 meters per second and only 1.49 meters per second in the vertical direction. Whereas the long jumper is doing 6.77 horizontally and 3.07 vertically. They need to get up higher so they're in the air long enough to get a better distance. Hurdlers don't wanna be in the air. They want those feet hitting the track again so they can keep pushing. When we start looking at different events, whether it's the long jump takeoff we just looked at, hurdling, or high jump takeoff, or throwing the shot put, or even in other sports when we take a look at throwing a basketball for a free throw, okay, when you take that shot, what's the optimal angle? When we start looking at tennis and its first serve, golf and a golf drive, okay, all of these angles and speeds reflect the conversion of energy to optimize the distance in terms of where they're trying to get the motion to go. Now on the next slide, I have a graph that's gonna show you the optimal angles that we typically see to go ahead and get the results that we're looking for in different events, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look. Notice the first one we see there is the pole vault. The whole goal of the pole vault is not to go forward very much, just forward enough to get over the pole. And so our optimal goal is to go up. And so you can see have a much higher vertical component than we do horizontal. As you start looking at different events that try and get distance, you see a lowering of that angle down to somewhere around 45 degrees. Okay. Now, this is gonna be a key point and we'll come back to this a little later, but you'll see that the one that goes out furthest is the throw for distance. And that is going to be at 45 degrees. It goes farther than all of the others. You can also begin to see composite vectors coming into play and starting to look at similar results for different angles. We notice that 60 degrees, a badminton serve, and at 30 degrees, we actually see them landing at the same point. The time that it takes for those two different paths is very different. 30 degrees is gonna go much faster. Badminton serve at 60 degrees is gonna take more time because it's up in the air for longer. But because of that increased hang time, they're able to travel just as far as the one that has a greater horizontal component. Now, a key thing we need to keep in mind when we start looking at projectiles, Remember, gravity is the only force acting on the system. And because of this, the horizontal component of the velocity does not change. It's going to be constant, all right? The Y component does change because it's under the influence of gravity, which remember is an acceleration at 9.8 meters per second squared, but the horizontal component does not. So by breaking them apart, we can do kinematics with the vertical component and simply calculate the amount of time and the distance traveled for the horizontal component. So in this diagram, you see that the horizontal component is going to be spaced evenly all the way across because it covers the same amount of distance and the same amount of time all the way. But that's not the case for the vertical component the spaces between the snapshots get bigger and bigger and bigger because the distance covered is greater because the ball is accelerating, the cannonball in this case, as it goes ahead and goes through time. So on the next slide, we actually have an animation that's gonna show this to you. And we can watch those two different components and how they combine to make the actual parabolic motion we see with a projectile. So there's the path. There goes the fire. Look at the two component vectors. Okay, the horizontal component, notice as it's fired, stays constant, the same, the entire route, whereas the vertical component increases 
over time as the acceleration of gravity takes over. If you watch V of X at the bottom, 100 meters per second, constantly the whole time. If you look at V of Y, we start as low as 20, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way up to 20 as you go through time, all right? So the horizontal vector is constant, stays the same size, but the vertical component steadily increases according to the acceleration of gravity. <clears throat> One good example of a place where we would go ahead and use this information to go ahead and do calculations is if we did something like an aid drop. Uh, things like the UN and other service organizations, they will fly into dangerous regions and drop supplies of aid, food, water, uh, first aid kits, etc from an airplane so they don't have to stay in the region and risk getting um, injured or killed, but they can drop supplies in to those that are suffering under the conditions of the war or whatever conditions we're dealing with. Now, remember the vertical component changes, increases with gravity. The horizontal component is constant. So if we drop a package, it's going to have some initial momentum moving forward. And so that velocity is going to continue and the package will travel at the same speed as the plane. So when it hits the ground, it will still be below the plane, again, neglecting air resistance. But the vertical component is going to increase over time due to gravity. Now, when we start looking at these kind of paths, we've mostly looked at things that are dropped. But as we saw when we were looking at doing our kinematics yesterday with um, gravity included, you get that nice parabolic shape. It can go up and come down and we can go ahead and see what happens over time. This is a good example of this. You see that it goes up until it peaks out at zero in terms of the vertical component. And then it starts to go downward and it increases with gravity. Let's see another animation of this. There's the pathway. Notice, watch the vertical component, positive going up and then it hits zero and then it starts going down and it's negative, okay? That's important for you to identify. <clears throat> we talked about this, that at a certain height, unless you're at the peak, you're actually gonna have two different times where it hits that point because you have one going up and you have one coming down. Now, when we're trying to optimize distance, and this is something that's been done back into Aristotle times, we can see the work of many different scientists trying to get trajectories for cannons to optimize protection of military outposts, okay? The maximum range that we are going to get in terms of distance is going to be 45 degrees. Everything else is going to have a complementary angle where the two numbers will add up to 90 degrees. So if you look at 45 plus 45, they're complementary. They add up to 90. That is the maximum distance you can reach. If you go 30 and 60, you travel the same distance, but you do it in two different ways. The 30 degree is gonna go very fast, but not have a lot of time in the air. The 60 degree is gonna have a lot of time in the air, but not go that fast. But that increased time in the air allows it to travel the same distance, okay? So what would the complementary angle be to 25? Take a minute, pause the video, and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so what'd you come up with? Well, hopefully you were able to come up with 65 because 25 plus 65 is 90. And so those composite out angles will always add up to 90. So ballistics, this is a great example of what we're talking about here, trying to get those optimal angles. In fact, <clears throat> da Vinci, was one of the people that looked at this, four mortars firing stones into the courtyard of a fort by da Vinci in the year 1504. He was looking at trajectories and where cannons should be placed to go ahead and reach as many places as possible if an opposing force was trying to attack. So let's do a quick quiz and see what we can go ahead and find. So let's assume in this problem, a battleship simultaneously fires two shells at enemy ships. If the shells follow the parabolic trajectory shown in the picture below, which ship gets hit first? Ship A, ship B, both at the same time, or we need more information. Pause the video here, try and think it through. 
Okay, welcome back. What'd you decide? Well, some of you may have said ship A because it's closer, so it takes less time to reach it. Some of you may have said ship B because it has a more flat trajectory, so it's going to be traveling faster to get there. And some of you may have said both at the same time, but hopefully you needed a little bit more information. When we go ahead and take a look at these examples, do we assume they have the same velocity when they are fired, regardless of what trajectory they take? If they do, then the parabola we see to reach ship A should take the same time as ship B, but it's gonna have more vertical component and less horizontal. But if they don't have the same velocity when fired from their cannon, then we don't really know which one's going to hit first and which one's going to hit second. So what are our keys to projectile motion? The keys to understanding this break down depending on the vertical or horizontal. In horizontal motion, are there any forces present? Yes or no? And the answer has to be no. Okay. There can't be an acceleration or a force in horizontal motion, which means our velocity is constant. With vertical motion, however, we are under the force of gravity, meaning there is an acceleration of g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. And so as such, the velocity will be changing by that 9.8 meters per second every single second. Now, if we were in class, we would go ahead and do a demonstration so that you could actually see this, that the vertical and horizontal components are easy to separate out and do not impact the rate of descent because both objects are being influenced by gravity. In this particular time lapse, they took pictures at the same time interval uh, of both of the balls as they were falling. Notice that the point at which they reach is the same during the same amount of time, even though the yellow ball is moving to the right and the other is falling straight down. So the red ball falls vertically and the yellow ball is given a kick to the right, but are dropped at the same time, meaning they fall at the same rate and are spaced evenly. This track can be passed, creating that nice projectile motion that we've been talking about. All right, so when you have a projectile, you have your initial velocity. Gravity is always acting downward. And if we're going to fire up, we can think about this velocity as being broken into two components. Those component vectors are our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity. And over time, as we go ahead and fire, we can go ahead and see that the vertical component is going to change, but the horizontal component does not, creating a parabolic path which the projectile travels upon, okay? So the rising half, we hit a peak where V equals zero, at least V sub Y, so the vertical component, and the horizontal component stays constant. So we can look at points along this and we can start looking at this. Now, if any of you have done uh, shooting with guns or bows and arrows or anything like this, you know that you usually can't, if the target's far enough away, actually aim directly at the target because you're going to see some decline in the elevation of the shot that you fire due to gravity and this projectile motion property. So if I were to fire, oh, okay, the actual place is going to hit is lower than that because of gravity accelerating the object downward. Okay, there's the path that it travels. Now, if you're doing target shooting, you'll see that those that shoot tend to aim a little bit higher because if they didn't, they're gonna hit low. So you aim a little bit up and we get our, there you go. We can get right on the bullseye. The ultimate example of this is to put an object into space. So if we're on the planet and we have a tall tower if we fire something outward, it's going to fall down with a parabola. But if you fire it faster and faster and faster, eventually you're going to get to a point where that object is going to travel around and keep falling at the same amount as the Earth curves. And we've just put an object into orbit. And this is actually a concept that was included in Isaac Newton's A Treatise of the Systems of the World that was published after his death in 1729. Unfortunately, he passed in 1727, and so he didn't get to see the impact of this. But this is something that he was thinking about and talking about. 
and we can see there's a nice round orbit, even though most of the ones we're talking about are elliptical. Um, this is the concept we're talking about. All right, quick review and we'll call it good. The projectile has both a vertical and horizontal component of velocity. The only force acting upon the projectile once it has left the hand or is fired from the gun is gravity. And we're neglecting air resistance, so don't forget that. Which means we have a constant acceleration in the downward direction of 9.8 meters per second squared. And the horizontal velocity does not change because we're neglecting air resistance. If on the rise, gravity causes vertical component to get smaller and smaller, if it's fired upward, at the very top of its path, it's going to have a vertical component of zero. And on the falling portion, it's going to increase according to that 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. If the projectile lands at the same elevation as a starting point, at that point, it will have the same vertical speed as it did to begin with. But remember, it's a vector. So the velocity is different because of the direction. Same speed, not the same vector. And the time it takes to get to the top of the path is the same as the time it takes to get back to the bottom. So we can actually divide the parabolic motion into two even pathways. Lastly, the range of the projectile, where it lands, depends on its initial speed and the angle of elevation above the horizontal. So the last thing I'm gonna give you is an example for, for you to try. So well, I would like you to go ahead and give this practice a problem a try, and we will go ahead and go over this in class. So please come in with your ideas about how to approach it, and we will go ahead and try to work through it together. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Take care of yourselves. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.